believe Mark and Fitzhugh are in town doing whatever it is they do in town when they see a giant coming their way. The tallest giant I've ever seen. Not just a giant, a giant giant. He acts as though he's going to use a key to enter that drugstore, but then seems to change his mind. Keys are so slow and cumbersome. He starts destroying the place. Stand where you are. Stand. Now you're under arrest. Put your hands behind your head. Never mind the officer down call, he's dead. That guy broke his neck with one hit. Some guy in a beard and hat has been following our murderer. He just came out of hiding, so it's the perfect time for Fitzhugh to panic. Fitzhugh, quiet! You're crazy. Your concern for that gentleman warms my heart, sir. Ever hear of a thing called checking his pulse? See if he's breathing? His head's still on frontwards, so you never know. Oh, Fitzhugh, you've done it again. Steve gets on the radio to Dan. Are you all right? No, far from it. Now, Dan, you know the area that we're, we're going to check out tonight? I want you and Valor to get there fast and then wait to hear from me. Right. And, Dan, be careful. In one minute, this whole area is going to be swarming with SID men. You got that? Yeah. Steve, is there something you forgot to tell him? Like Mark and Dimwit have been captured? Of course, Betty and Barry stay behind. Captain Ray reporting to headquarters. It's all secure here. I'm coming in. Well, the special officer was dead when the ambulance got here. A broken neck. An inspector. Impossible as it may seem, it must have been the little people. I want him to explain how. Maybe they used that thing Dan is holding. We've introduced something new this season. Gadgets. That thing is a laser gun of sorts that they use to cut through things like an acetylene torch. I don't think it's capable of bashing a door in, causing all that destruction, or breaking a giant's neck. His evidence? Little people have been seen in the area, and they hit a drugstore probably looking for medicine of some kind. I stand in awe of your detecting skills, sir. Meanwhile, the actual perpetrator has wandered off into the woods in the general direction of the spindrift. That dog responds to commands as well as the average cat does. Chipper runs away right into a sand pit. All Barry can do is watch helplessly. He called it quicksand, but it's really just super loose sand. Sure acts the same as quicksand, though. That shaggy dog covered in sand for thank you. Steve has followed the man in the little people hat to a building where the man went inside. He calls Dan and reports his position, then pulls out our next gadget. Mark was busy over the summer break. He 
He can see the killer working out, but not much else. He lowers periscope and submerges to 65 feet. He's on land. 65 feet of what? Are you impressed, little man? I can't believe it. That is not the same man. It's the same man. We should be dead by now. He's a machine, fits you. Zorro, save him. A remarkable robot, Professor. I prefer to call him the hydraulic man. That'll never catch on. How about Android? And why did you tell him to kill people and destroy drugstores? I've read about you little people. Your technology is way ahead of us, and I need help. Well, you won't get it from me, Professor. Why not? Because your invention's a deadly one. It's too dangerous to even exist. It wasn't meant to be dangerous. It was meant to be beneficial. After what we saw earlier tonight, you can't be serious. What happened tonight wasn't meant to happen. It was a complete malfunction. A malfunction that took a man's life and you're responsible for it. You seem to be glossing over that part. Broderick Crawford spent his early years in vaudeville with his parents and later on Broadway. There he made his fame playing Lenny in an adaptation of Steinbeck's novel of Mice and Men. Hollywood came calling and he won an Oscar for his performance in All the King's Men. When he moved to television, he was equally successful, especially as Dan Matthews on the Highway Patrol, which ran from 1955 to 1959. Some of my earliest memories are of him on the TV with the radio microphone in his hand saying, 2150 to base. I had no idea what it meant, but I really dug the way he said it, and his voice was awe-inspiring. You helped me find the problem, and I guarantee you the gratitude of our government. We've had ample proof of your government's gratitude. But you can trust me. Oh, well, that settles it then. After all, you wouldn't lie to us about a thing like that, now would you? I mean, you're... Who are you? Still, they have two options. Play ball with him or stay in the cage until who knows when. I don't know about fits you, but Mark has things to do, so staying here isn't a good choice. All right, but I may be of no help at all. But you are willing to try since I still don't know who you are, I'll just say... You got it, dude! He has a separate little travel cage to carry Mark back and forth. I'm Professor Ito Gorham, Milk Institute, working on a grant from the state. And you? Mark Wilson, Caltech and MIT. Designer and consultant in space technology. And the other Earthling? Alexander Fitzhugh. If he's not a scientist, what does he do? What the rest of us do, he fights for survival. And you're helping so very much. There's a separate little room in this place where Gorn and his assistant actually control the robot. Oh, Mr. Wilson, this is Mr. Zorro. He's going to help us. My assistant was at the controls when a malfunction took place. Did you receive any feedback from the robot to the board? Yes. I'm amazed you would have guessed it. Lights indicated that hydraulic systems I hadn't programmed for use had been activated. That face is unique. Stuart Margolin was using that distinctive face plus his acting talent to build a career, and like millions of other people, I know him best as a semi-regular on Love American style. He's been just about everywhere on TV and done just about everything, and he's a comedic force to be reckoned with. His character Stosh Robbins, the plastic surgeon, only appeared on MASH one time, but everybody who saw it remembers it. He's that good. And he's still going at 80. In addition to acting, he does a lot of directing. May you live much longer and may your health never fail, sir. Mark wants to see the robot schematics, the diagrams of his electronic components and how they're put together. I have to keep reminding myself that this is 1969 because those diagrams are using vacuum tubes. Now, unless you're a guitarist who's particular about his amp or an electronic hobbyist in your own right, you might not know what that is. Before the days of microchips, we had these. Those glowing things are the tubes. They're the components that make the whole thing work because they can receive and decipher radio signals, amplify the sound. They did all the heavy lifting in radios, TV sets, amplifiers. Anything electronic probably had at least one in it. 
They were big, clunky, hot, devoured electricity like there was no tomorrow and had to be replaced every few years because they'd burn out. They changed the world of communication forever. Without them, we wouldn't have any of the electronics we have today. The introduction of transistors in the 50s changed everything. These were small, most of them didn't heat up, they were energy efficient compared to tubes, and as a rule, they cost less. America was a little slow on the uptake, but other countries pounced on this new invention. And that's how we got things like this. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a Japanese transistor radio. Going by those diagrams, the giants haven't developed transistors yet. And when Mark gets inside the robot, we'll see that he is indeed full of vacuum tubes. Which makes me wonder how many of them smash to pieces if he falls down. Dan and Valerie have finally caught up with Steve. Dan is ready to use that thing he's carrying to get them inside. Though why he's trying to make it look like a Mickey Mouse head, I don't know. Ah, my mistake. He was going for a kitty cat. Mark can't find any problems with the circuit diagrams. He says the behavior is like what happens when a living creature gets a sudden jolt of adrenaline. The professor has some thoughts about that. Are you going to let me out, professor? There's nothing keeping you in there except the trap door. You think I didn't find that out? I wouldn't budget more than an inch or two. Well, maybe you didn't have the proper stimulus. I can just about guarantee that by the time this is over, you'll want to take this guy down and pluck his beard hairs out one by one with a pair of pliers. Mark wants to know what he's doing. You Earth people are far ahead of us technically. You're also untrustworthy and deceitful. I want to see if you're playing a trick on me. Look, I've offered nothing more than a basic scientific theory. It could be completely wrong. We'll find out. To put it as simply as possible, he's never heard of adrenaline. He wants to see if it's a real thing and if it can do what Mark said it can do. Hit you, freeze! Don't move a muscle, it's your only chance! So, make him move. Bonus points if you can tell me what the heck that animal is. <laughs> Steve ordered Dan to stop being creative and just cut a perfectly round hole. And needless to say, Fitzhugh will get the door open, thus confirming what Mark said about adrenaline. The problem is, his mechanical creation doesn't have any actual adrenal glands. It doesn't even have the kidneys to put them on. What would be his equivalent? Mark has no idea. The professor has some more detailed plans in his office, so he puts Fitzhugh back in the cage and takes Mark to his office in the porta cage. While Dan heads there to spy on them, Steve uses his periscope to check on Fitzhugh. I see him. Is he hurt? Apparently not. He's trying to force his way out of the cage. Take a look. Or you could climb up there and help him, but having Valerie look is much more practical. And as it turns out, it's a good thing they didn't start climbing because there's an SID man at the door. I could say there's padding at the door because he's just there to tell them there's an APB out for the little people and to notify the authorities if they see any of them. It's meaningless except that the officer is gullible enough that when he sees the robot sitting perfectly still not even breathing, the professor says, that's one of my men, he's resting, and the dude buys it. Spindrift. Spindrift, come in. Steve, are you all right? So far, look, Betty, under any circumstances, I don't want you to leave the ship. We've been monitoring the SID. Where are you? I'll tell you later. Just, just hold tight now. Speaking of meaningless, that still describes Betty's part. You want to look at some more of these? They're of no use. Neither are you, unless we turn you in for the reward. The SID is still outside, you know. Oh, take it easy, Professor. I'm not refusing to help. All right, just say something helpful. 
yeah, say something helpful like, hey, SID man, this guy right here is responsible for that officer's death and I can prove it. Lose the attitude, Professor. Well, the command sequence isn't too complicated. It was complicated enough to cause a man's death and gut a drugstore. As I said, lose the attitude. That man is never going back to his family. He'll never get to do any of the things he wanted to. He was cut short and taken away from his loved ones forever because of you. And as we'll find out next episode, your government executes people for things like that. So you might want to be a little more humble because information like that has a bad habit of leaking out to the authorities when little people are around. It's a weird phenomenon that your best scientists haven't been able to figure out yet. The plan is to chain the mechanical giant to the floor and then repeat the command sequence that led to the malfunction. This is exactly what happened before, except this time the guy he's going after deserves it. Zorro can't shut the sequence down. Something is jammed. Oh, crap. Unlike the policeman, Gorn is still alive. He pretty well has to be if we're going to stop this thing. Zorro finally finds the right switch to turn it off right before it brings the killing blow down on the professor. But it's hard to say how much good that's going to do Mark. The little man isn't hurt seriously, Professor. He should be coming around any moment. Easy. You had quite a knocking around. Aside from a mild concussion, he's okay. He managed to tuck himself into a corner right before the robot stepped on him, which obviously worked much better than sitting there and accepting the squishing would have. Did you get the same jumbled feedback at the control panel? Exactly. You solved this problem for us. And I promise you our scientific department will do everything they can to help you get back to Earth. Oh, that's very generous, Professor. Don't forget the F. You have to repair the hydraulic man. And what kind of help can you offer, Professor? Vacuum tubes and servos that don't follow orders? But now Dan is all excited. That bucket of bolts over there could be our passport back to Earth. If Mark can fix it so it doesn't keep blowing, it's cool. We'll be going home soon. I wouldn't bet on that, and Dan is our resident skeptic about everything. This is out of character, especially taking the word of a giant. He's usually the one saying, don't do that. There's a panel on the robot's chest where all his control goodies reside. Mark will have to go in there and examine the components and connections directly. <laughs> Didn't that panel behind him come from the Jupiter 2? While Zorl has the robot perform various movements, Mark observes and analyzes. Those shiny things he's jiggling? Row upon row of those vacuum tubes I was talking about. If he held that one that long, he should be yelling for ice for his fingers by now. But some get hotter than others, so who knows. Whatever's causing it, Mark has had enough of this ride and he wants off, but he's found the problem. The insulation doesn't shield some of the connections, so the leakage causes a false electrical field. That'll do it. There's your adrenaline, Professor. Extra voltage going someplace it shouldn't be going. Wilson's found the problem. He needs rubberized tape. It won't take long. A few pieces of electrical tape and it's done. The hardest part was when Zorro couldn't remember where he put the tape and they wound up running to the hardware store and buying more. I'm sure it'll work now, Professor. Well, then it could be something that can fully prove its infallibility. 
Well, why not just repeat the other test? This one's gonna be too demanding. Get him ready for the test, Zorro. I foresee trouble. Have him stand up. Go to the cage. Pick up the fits you with me. But handle him gently. You can't do that! What's the matter, little man? Don't you trust your workmanship? He trusts his workmanship. He doesn't trust yours. <laughs> Mark's too much. Give him some tools and he'll fix anything. They still think they're going home. They have no idea what's going to happen next. Check out the new prop. I love it. The moving legs make it that much more convincing. Irwin really spared no expense to make this show, and you can see it. As we know, that was also the show's downfall, but let's not spoil this delightful moment with thoughts of that. Zorro has him put Fitzhugh back in the cage. Fitzhugh is freaked out beyond measure, and you can't blame him, but otherwise he's all right. Gorn says, return him to his chair and join me in the office. Gorn, what about your promise? I fixed it for you, now let us go. Gorn! They never learn. Those giants don't consider you human. You have no rights in their world. Your toys for them to play with or commodities for them to buy and sell. With the few rare exceptions we've seen, you cannot trust them. Secretary of Mech, please, it's Professor Gorn. Oh, that's all right, I'll win. Secretary Mech, Professor Gorin. I've got a surprise for you. It's finished? The hydraulic man is finished. I'm ready for a demonstration before the entire Supreme Council. Of course it's intended to be a machine of war. There's way more profit in that than in doing good for people, duh. And he's not about to let Mark go because the secretary wants a price on a second one. He needs to keep Mark around so he can check things over and make sure they don't repeat the previous problem. It's not like he made an actual promise to a sentient thinking being. I can foresee him sending Zorro to the pet store to get Mark and Fitzhugh some food. You know, that psychological impact might be made to work both ways. On the professor and the secretary as well as their enemies. Oh. And it'd be tough, maybe impossible. I need some time in that workroom undisturbed. He'll also need Steve and Dan to help him. The problem is buying the time he needs. Fitzhugh has an idea about that, but he'll need Valerie. You ingrates! You insufferable intellectual snobs! How dare you to abandon and leave me like this? You regret it, Burton. T Captain Burton! I will see that you every evil deed is disclosed. Fitzhugh is in the cage alone. He tells the professor, Mark's friends came and got him, but since I'm not a scientist, that bunch of uppity eggheads left me behind. It's impossible. There's no way into the building. For them, <laughs> their way's in and out. There is no room in their hearts. You don't believe me? They left another behind. Where? Over there someplace. She pleaded for my life. So they abandoned her. Her name is Valerie. Valerie, that's your... Q. Yes. I saw her. She ducks under the door into his office where there's lots of places to hide. They bring Fitzhugh along out of the cage and set him on the table. Are you sure you saw her? I could have sworn it, Professor. Are you even sure you saw her in the laboratory? Yes, sir. Uh, put the plans back in the box and we'll question Fitzhugh. Professor. Well, shucks. I guess a girl is no match for you two monumental intellects. Fitzhugh may be willing to talk, but I never will. One in form, it'll be enough. Go ahead, Fitzhugh. I believe I noticed some of the spiritus fermenti on the sideboard yonder. A small dollop would do wonders for my memory. Zola, bring him some whiskey. Got an eyedropper handy? Mm. 
That ain't no eyedropper. If he finishes that and they question him, every answer may have something to do with pink elephants. Sir, what was your most recent unexplained disaster? Let's see, the, uh, the destruction of the munitions dump right near the airport. Said to be done by the underground. They call themselves Forces for Freedom. There's some of this world's rebel freedom fighters. Or terrorists, depending on who's talking. You couldn't be more wrong. The person responsible is one of the little people. A woman known only as Betty. <laughs> Truly the devil's handmaiden. Look at that sinister face. She'd just as soon gut you as look at you. She directs all the activities of the little people? I <laughs> know me. <laughs> but she's the most ruthless of them all. This man, Dan, if, if he committed all the crimes you give him credit for, why didn't they execute him on Earth? Couldn't catch him, that's why. Couldn't catch him. A regular win of the whips. Wisp. That. How is he still holding that thing? For that matter, how is he still talking? Well, the hiding place. Where's the hiding place? Hmm. Hiding place? Who's got the hiding place? <laughs> the hiding place. <laughs> Miss Valerie, where's the hiding place? Marcus finished building his whatever he's doing. Now he, Steve, and Dan are off to install it in the robot. Hide him, please. Hide him, please. Oh, oh, oh. to hide him. Dead drunk. Put him back in the holding cage. We're going to get ready for the secretary. And just in time. I don't know how he held on that long. When I was around 19 or 20, I had an overactive liver. I could put away half a quart of vodka and have to pretend to be drunk. I've never been drunk drunk in my life, and believe me, I tried a few times. Fitzhugh's liver puts mine to shame. Fitzhugh, Fitzhugh, that was a great performance. Thank you, my dear. It was a performance. <laughs> I'm afraid I overacted just a teensy weensy bit. Mark's widget is hooked up, the secretary is here, and they're ready for the demonstration. What happened? I've lost control, Professor. Well, stop him. He's letting the little people go. Okay, that's it. Everybody out of the robot. Let's see what this thing can do. Where are you sending him? To his destruction, I hope. Is there a nice blast furnace nearby he could jump into? The crew may wish they hadn't done that because now there's a problem. Mark, you've got to stop it. I can't. The signal's not strong enough to reach. Mark's signal isn't strong enough, and that's too bad for Professor Gorn. His creation destroyed him. These giants aren't just way behind us technologically, they're also way behind us literarily. They're a hundred years late coming up with Frankenstein. I was in final with Chipper. Chipper was lucky. I tell you, Barry, I know what I'm talking about. Believe me. Why would he be so gentle with a trapped animal? He saved Chipper's life. Why, Mr. Fitzhugh? Very, I guess. Sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about. Admitting it is the first step toward dealing with it, Fitzhugh. You've taken a big step today. That was a good season opener. It had everything we expected and a few things we didn't, like the new gadgets. They'll stick around, too. As I said, Mark was busy over the break. We had two world-class guest stars and a story in which the little people have to save the giants from their own government's violent intentions. You know those robots were destined either to go to war against somebody or oppress their own people. 
Who are they at war with? We don't know, and best I can recall, we never will. It doesn't matter. This government is totalitarian and violent against its own citizens. There's a rebellion going on somewhere, and it's not hard to guess who gets the little people's vote if they get the chance. My only gripe is the way Betty is treated. There's no good reason for her even to be there. Why have the character if you're not going to use her at all? It's the Judy Robinson syndrome all over again. She even got a new outfit this season. I hope we'll get to see her do stuff eventually. Valerie is an integral part of the team now, even though Steve still tried to leave her behind once in this episode. The good news there is she's learning to tell him no. Fitzhugh is as fascinating as ever, and Chipper is as obedient as ever, which is to say I'm not sure he even knows his name. Barry, weave some vines together and make a leash. You'll have fewer nightmares that way. The rest are their usual selves, and it's like seeing old friends again. We came to care about these people in the first season, and we're starting the second season by watching them learn to adapt, create, and otherwise use everything at their disposal to survive, all the while continuing to look for that opportunity that's just out of reach, the one that will take them home. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you see, please click the thumbs up. It really does help the channel. If you're not subscribed yet, the button looks something like this. So click it and join our little family. There's a bell there that may or may not actually work to give you notifications when we post something, but it can't hurt to click it just in case. Again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Don't rearrange the words unless you know you're going to. Right? Mm-hmm. She knows. He came out of hidings. He just came... Okay. He can see the killer working out, but not by... <laughs> and later on Broadway, where he made his fame... Blah, blah. And later on Broadway, where he made his fame... Ah, come on! And later on Broadway, where he made his fame... Oh, come on! Hollywood came calling and... Call... Cash. Hollywood came calling. Where he made his fame playing Lenny in an adaptation of Steinbeck's novel... I'm out of there. Nobody actually realized Steinbeck wrote that.